Uh, it came to light from uh, a resignation letter that you had uh, put forward and then uh, made its rounds through social media as well um, that you believe that there are certain issues going on uh, with our detention facilities. Uh, and at this point, uh, I, I would like to hear from you about what what you think those issues are, and then we'll we'll hear from uh, my colleagues here uh, if they have any questions for you. Uh, assuming that you're you're uh, okay with yes. uh, questions, um, so uh, with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to you. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, thank you, uh, members of the committee, for taking the time to listen. Um, I served as the civilian oversight commissioner from June of 2022 until that my last day was May 31st of 2023. Um, the detention facilities oversight board faced significant obstruction from uh, the corrections commissioner um, and us as an oversight uh, division uh, helping the oversight board also faced significant obstruction from the corrections commissioner uh, and uh, she was backed by the city councilor's office in her obstruction. And just to, I'll cite some examples, just from the beginning, from the moment we started as an oversight board, one of the first things we did was conduct an orientation. And as part of that orientation process, it called for a review of over uh, detention facility overview. How are the facilities run? And we invited uh, the corrections commissioner to come up here before the board uh, she eventually did in September of, or I'm sorry, it was in October. The initial invite was in September, but then in October of 22 was when she came. She came with the city councilor's office, uh, refused to answer questions unless they were submitted in writing and reviewed by the city councilor's office first. Um, questions uh, that were asked, her answers were, look, look at our website. There was no attempt to participate or cooperate with the oversight board. We scheduled two different uh, tours for board members to review the CJC, um, and she initially refused to allow certain members of the board to par participate in the tour because of their positions, uh, because of their jobs. Uh, when we objected, she changed her objection to they can uh, participate on the board and come on those tours, but then they can't come into the jail as part of their everyday jobs. And to this day, they still cannot go to the jail as part of their jobs because of their position as board members. Um, so the tours um, were very limited in scope. Uh, one of the repeated requests of the oversight board and us has been able to speak with detainees and that has uh, happened in extremely limited circumstances. I believe the chair of the board has been able to speak shortly for one period of time with a detainee, um, but our repeated request to speak with detainees about the conditions has been denied or tabled or, but we could not speak with uh, detainees. Um, some of the other uh, obstructions were, and, and, and during this time, um, there are deaths happening in the facility. I mean, since during my time there, there were six different deaths that happened. In March, we received word that two inmates or detainees had been stabbed. We didn't receive that from the corrections commissioner. We didn't receive any information about that, about the circumstances, whether that could be verified or not. Right shortly before I left, we received word that one of the guards at the center had been assaulted. Um, but again, that didn't come from her. And the ability to, our repeated requests for information as to what was happening were just denied. Um, we re made repeated requests for the internal resolution request, the inter informal internal complaint system that detainees utilize. This, the ordinance specifically says we're entitled to those. Um, and, and at one point when I spoke, speaking with the commissioner, she said, well, those don't refer to my IRRs. Those refer to ones that you have to make up. 
So she was denying the very existence of that, even though they're the only IRs in existence that, that they had applied to her. So it was just repeated refusal to cooperate, to have any information as to what was going on. If I could jump in real yep. quick, just for clarity, could you define what an IRR is? I believe it stands for internal resolution request. And so if a detainee uh, at the CJC has a complaint about what is happening, that's their first line of complaint is, hey, I, don't, I was mistreated, the pro process isn't being followed, uh, what have you. Thank you. Um, and there's, in the mayor's executive order, the first executive order she issued, that was one of the things that she commanded, dictated that needed to be shared with those IRRs. Um, so it, it, it just got to the point where it didn't look like we were gonna be able to do uh, the job that we were assigned to do. And, and we wanna make it clear that oversight is not currently happening. We, we don't have any insight uh, as to what is going on um, you know, there were, there was different ob objections that were made at different times, but the minute that objection was satisfied or, um, another one would arise. Um, the, one of the first things the DFOB did was pass rules and procedures for its internal operations. Then it passed rules and procedures on how to share complaints. Then it passed rules and procedures on how to conduct investigations. Um, and then I was later told by the Corrections Commissioner, well, I can't share this with you because you don't have rules and procedures. I said, well, here they are. Um, and she refused to uh, review them or look at them or comment on them. And said, so, well, since I haven't reviewed them, they don't count. Um, so at one point I even asked her, well, what can you share with us? What is the point of where you, we can, you can cooperate with us? And she refused to answer. I got no answer. Uh, so that, that uh, in a nutshell, uh, is just without the information and without access to the CJ, CJC, the board and the division cannot conduct a proper function of oversight. So if there's any questions. Yeah, to... so um, in, in the time since you, uh, when, when did you resign? Uh, effective May 31st of 2023. Okay. And uh, I, I don't know if you're still in touch with anyone on uh, the board in the time since your resignation. Has any of the, the information changed? Yeah. I've, I have, I've talked to the board members, a couple of board members, but I don't believe anything has changed since then, but I can't speak to specifics. Okay, uh, then at this point, uh, I'd like to open it up uh, to the uh, committee for questions. Uh, I guess it would be in, in order, but uh, first I'd like to, to ask uh, Alderman Clark Hubbard, as she was the, the sponsor of the bill that, uh, that created this, uh, this board, uh, if she has any uh, questions. Right, I don't have any specific questions. The relationship that I built with Commissioner Brahman, I have full respect for, and so uh, if just personally, my passion for civilian oversight on both sides of this legislation. Um, this whole process now is heartbreaking. And to hear that there is none in place right now is heartbreaking. Um, I still believe in civilian oversight. I still believe in the need for civilian oversight. So I'm here and ready to um, still fight for civilian oversight, whatever that means and whatever that looks like. And being able to hear, um, hear these facts and hear these um, testimonies on it um, is most important when we see whatever our path forward is for civilian oversight here in the city of St. Louis. So I'm um, here listening. Uh, I think I would be remiss if I didn't thank the staff of the civilian oversight that is still standing in the gap here that are here with us today. And so um, with that, I'll continue to listen. And if I have any questions come up, I ask to be recognized. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Alderman Keyes, do you have any questions for Mr. Brummer? Um, no, thank you so much for bringing these um, these things to light. Uh, as uh, Alderwoman uh, Clark Hubbard has said, this is very uh, disturbing. It's uh, disheartening um, because the oversight provides advocacy. And um, to hear that so many efforts have been 
um, made to to do the actual work of advocating and having oversight um, and having worked in the criminology field for 20 plus years. This is very concerning to me. Um, uh, I'll continue to, uh, to listen and uh, get as much information as, as we can uh, about this, but this, this sounds very bad. Thank you. Thank you, Alderwoman. Uh, Alderwoman Velasquez, do you have any questions for Mr. Brummert at this time? Um, can you just talk a little bit about, and you, you did an overview, but what were the parts of the ordinance that you felt like had been in most violation in, in your experience? It, it was just the request for access for information. The ordinance lays out, and, and we're talking about different ordinances because there's a, a DFOB ordinance that was in effect the whole time, and then there were a couple different more general COB ordinances that also came into effect that had some... But, but the main things was that we were entitled to different reports and information that we weren't receiving. And so uh, at one point, uh, Interim Director Isom ordered her to provide use of force reports to us for investigation, and then that has never happened. We've never received them. So, but that, that's the biggest, is just we don't have any knowledge of what's happening. And I know the DFOB board is separate, I mean, has different legislation is separate from the COB board, and you've resigned, but what are the things that just in your mind for, what do, do you have any, from your experience, recommendations on how we keep things moving forward and what, how we should direct or not direct, I mean, how we can. I, I initially thought it would be a, something as simple as having the city councilor's office weigh in, no, this is what the ordinance means, this is what compliance would look like, and that has not happened to that. Um, and so I, I think it's, it, you cannot conduct effective oversight without access to the information. I mean, that's just, that's the critical question. Um, if we're not able to talk to detainees or conduct investigations or understand what the complaints are, we, we can't do our job. So I, I think it would just be, I mean, I would be, I think the director of public safety needs to step in and, and, and make this happen. So, and that wasn't happening. And then you mentioned that one of the beginning parts of working with the commissioner was doing the training. Correct, and, and but yes. did the training, did it meet the requirements of the ordinance or how did that? Uh, um, so the ordinance, it was the orientation for the board is what we were trying to conduct. Um, I don't think so. So we were in the process when I left of developing a different part of orientation without her cooperation. We're just like, well, we have to get it done. Um, so, but there, and, and the idea that some of the board members need training, I mean, one of the board members is a former corrections officer. One of our investigators worked as an investigator at corrections for over a decade. I mean, so it's not, um, and those aren't prerequisites to give, receiving the information. I don't have any other questions at this time. Thank you, Alderwoman. Uh, Alderwoman Sunnier, do you have any questions for Mr. Brummert at this time? I do. Um, first, Mr. Bremer, I want to thank you for your courage, um, for, you know, there are many ways that you could have resigned or you could have left, but I appreciate you accepting the invitation and, and coming today and doing, you know, doing your job of making sure that the public knows um, about what's going on from all perspectives. I think that's the only way that we can have the truth is if all spaces are able to put out their experiences, but I also know that that is always not easy, that that comes with, you know, challenges in other areas, and so I just want to first let you know that I, you know, I respect you and I appreciate you for coming before us today and being willing to answer our questions and give some insight. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, so I'm curious about when you first joined, because um, I, 
have such a passion for criminal justice reform. I was so excited, like so many other people in our city, about a civilian oversight board. And so I remember reading um, about you when you first joined and hearing, like seeing some of the excitement. So I'm curious about when you first signed on to, to the job, how was it explained to you? Um, was there a sort of uh, an understanding when you first began of what some of the processes would be, or was it kind of like, we're going to start this and we're going to kind of develop it as it moves? I'm just curious about when you first joined, what was that like and what were the expectations at that time? Well, well when I first joined, it was the idea that we were going to build this division of civilian oversight to function as um, an investigative body and conduct civilian oversight investigations, but that it was still to be determined a lot of how that was going to look. It hadn't been done that way before. Um, so I had worked with the Corrections Commissioner as an FBI agent. Um, uh, so I was uh, hopeful that I would be able to work uh, with her and that there was some prior relationship, but that just turned out not to be the case. That it just, um, it, it was just, we came to a standstill. There was just, I was requesting information, she was refusing to provide it, and we just were stuck. Um. Um, so I guess specifically, you know, it's a job, it's a description, so what was sort of like, you know, processes or, or channels at that time, or how your responsibilities were explained to you as, you know, the person kind of as the commissioner of it? I'm, I'm curious about, like, what that was defined as at, at that point. Uh. It was, it, was, it was pretty broad in, in, in my sense that it was, and, it, and the job description changes with each ordinance too, so um, it was pretty, pretty wide open. So I don't know if you have a specific thing in mind. I, I guess I'm not. Um, so, so the training, because you mentioned that a lot. So were you told in the beginning that you know, there would need to be a training that would be required in order for you to access facilities and records? So, no, that's not in the ordinance. I don't, I, this, the idea that the training's required, there's an orientation process that's put in the ordinance for the board. Um, of course, you want training for our own investigators, and we conducted extensive training. We held internal in, trainings all the time. I conducted, I was a trainer at the FBI. I was conducting the trainings. I was having other staff members conduct the trainings for our investigators, but that's not part of the ordinance. That was just something that the commissioner kept putting up there as, hey, you need to do this training before you can have access. But that was just her decision. And even though um, I initially objected, and then at the end, I found some little, my, myself and our investigators went through that training, uh, it was, I, the other members that went through it, myself, said it was like a second grader had put together the PowerPoint. We got eight hours on the Prison Rape Elimination Act. How that's relevant to conducting oversight, I don't know. Um, it did, so it made it seem like this is just something to be put out there. And it also made me worried if this is the actual training that incoming employees are receiving, uh, it's, it was concerning uh, in its scope and nature. In, in your time of service, which was about a year, yes, um, were you were you given access to review any any records? Were any you know at any point where some of your requests or access there, facilities or just records? just very very limited instances? There was one time she handed like a random twenty reports of like inmate letters, but it wasn't the actual reports or any kind of comprehensive. It just seemed like. Here's one on my desk. You can have this. Um, and then we did receive a, the jail roster a couple different times, but that that was about it. And did you did you participate in the training? Did, so yes. you did attend the training. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. Um, and then I know you mentioned. It seems like sort of the conversation is around confidentiality. Did you? So boards I've been a part of we. There is always confidentiality because there is always the concern for litigation. Did you, as commissioner, um, ever have any conversations about the idea of uh, closed meetings? You know, most yes. of the boards, that's what we do when there's time to discuss confidential matters. Yeah, that, that was one of the objections cited is we don't, we're not uh, 
we don't think you have sufficient confidentiality clauses. And, I, and my response was, well, there's a confidentiality mandate in the ordinance. We do have a confidentiality that's part of the board's rules and procedures. We put in a confidentiality provision. And then we were told, well, that's not good enough. And I said, well, what would be good enough? And I didn't get an answer. And I would offer suggestions. I'd say, well, would this be good enough? And it would be, uh, maybe. And, <laughs> okay. So that, to me, that suggested, well, we don't really want this to take place. We'd rather have the objection that this is insufficient rather than <laughs> uh, let's make this work. You know, if we, because I think the board would have been very amenable to, you tell us what clauses are needed to make this work, we're, we're, we'll entertain them. Um, and that just wasn't how that it functioned. And along those lines, um, was there any specific directives from, um, did anyone ever ask kind of on you all's behalf that any records be released? I don't know if it would have been the city councilor. You mentioned maybe she, she played a middle role. Did she ever at any point kind of instruct records to be turned over or give any? I, I would... We're getting into some of the city councilors' opinions, and and so I, I, I will, which are privileged, I, I believe, mm -hmm. um, or uh, she's claimed privileged over, um, or maybe not the city councilor. Was there any city entity or city official or any party that said, "Hey, these kind of help to set the criteria of"? These documents need to be turned over. Did any that I mean that was other than uh, Director Isom's ordered that use of force reports be given to us for investigative purposes? No. No. And was there an official response given when, or was it just no, we're not turned over? Was there kind of a ex, was there any explanation? Well, most of the time it was silence. Most of the time it was there would uh, just not be a response or it'd be a very delayed response. Uh, but sometimes it would just be no because you need to do train more training or or what have you. Um. Okay, and also I read your I read the resignation letter, and I saw you mentioned, you know, for me my hope would be that we would figure out how to resolve this. But I saw that you stated, you know, if, even if this particular challenge is removed, I feel as though another one will be placed. And so I'm just curious, can you elaborate on what you meant by that? Just, just in my experience is that the objections from the Corrections Commissioner and the City Councilor's Office, when they were met or answered, new ones would arise. And so even if these current ones, that, and so part of the process we were asking is, if we conduct and finish this orientation process, where we go through the training, is this going to resolve the concerns? And we never got that insurance. We never got that, yeah, okay, then, then we're going to be good, then we can move forward. It was just we'll see. And so that's where it's like, okay, um, it, it feels like there's, they don't want this to work. Uh, uh, they don't want uh, light brought into what's happening at the, at the CJC. They don't want it to be known. Um, that's the only logical conclusion you can come to. Um, so I have to answer your question. It does. And I know you say you went through the training at the time that you left. I know it's been a little bit of time. How, how much of the board had undergone the, the training? So the board had, the, the agreement was that myself and the investigators would go through the training and then see if there's, I mean, because we didn't think it was reasonable to ask board members who are volunteers to take 16 hours from their day to come to this training when we don't know how relevant it is. And and so we would go through it and then determine afterwards what, if anything, would be relevant. And I think there's probably what would the board would need could be covered in an hour, would be my assessment. So you, so are you saying, I'm trying to understand, are you saying that the original understanding was yourself and the investigators would undergo the, the training and that would be sufficient for everyone to get access to the facilities and yes. records? Yes, yeah, the, the, the director, it was my understanding Director Coyle had, had said that the board could have access with investigators who had gone through the training. They could have access to the facilities. Okay. Um, and I guess another question I do have is kind of connected to just could you tell us about the role of an investigator? I know there's also seven other employees just to kind of get an understanding of the design of it. 
Yeah, so we're, uh, the legal investigators are the ones that are going to be conducting the first instance investigation. So if there's a complaint about conduct uh, or a condition within the CJC, they will be conducting the interviews, gathering the information, video footage, and writing the report as to what actually happened. Okay. Yep. And during your 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 tenure of, of service, were you were you ever in a position where you would have been able to take you know any type of disciplinary action or accountability action for uh, corrections office workers or staff there? Were you? No, no, we we, we weren't because um, that came under the last ordinance that passed and became effective in March, mm -hmm. and that has a year transition period. So we were never where we would actually be deciding the discipline. We had never gotten to that point. And I know this board is separate from the DFOB, but I'm also curious, for the sake of just understanding the structure of it, have any of these challenges um, arise with the, with the police department in, like, obtaining records that they yes. may hear? Yeah, so the Civilian Oversight Board, for much of the, uh, my time, was under a court in injunction that we weren't allowed to operate. So they, they were just, for a period of, I think, from September through March, uh, there was, we weren't allowed to do anything. Um, but we found out right before I left that that was the one part. When I got there, that's what was happening at Oversight, is we'd receive a complaint. We would give it to internal affairs at the police department. They would conduct the investigation. They would send it back to us with the results, and then the board would review the results and agree or disagree. We, at the, towards my end, uh, we, had, we asked internal affairs where are the completed investigations, and they had been told not to provide them to us. Um, and we weren't even aware that they were told not to provide them to us. So. Okay, um, um, I guess this is similar to what Alderwoman Vasquez, oh, sorry, I have one more thing that you, it was also in your resignation letter. You mentioned that you attempted to go to the facility and you, and it was, you were forcibly removed, yourself and some other members. Could you talk about that? Um, I know that happened to the, uh, the chair of the board, that they were removed from the facility when they were attempting to exercise their right within the ordinance to visit the facility. Um, my, my experience was I was told by, and this would have been last year, there had been a death at the facility. Um, I was asked to go, and this was at night, so 9 or 10 o'clock at night, I was asked to go to the jail um, and find out what happened, get the information. Um, so I was speaking to the inv police investigators who were there. The commissioner came in and shut it down, and that was the end. Uh, she asked, what was I doing there? was not happy I was there. And, I mean, I wasn't forcibly removed, but there was no point in me uh, being there anymore. Okay. Um, and I think that my next question just uh, doubles back to what all the women of Vasquez asked as well. Um, are there anything specific and tangible that you think that we could do? And I really want to say that, obviously, with the emphasis on the fact that we're a legislative board, so is there any specific policies and practices that you think, if we were to enact, could be helpful to the board operating to its function? I can't think of anything specific. I think the legislation, as now, is it will work if it's followed. It just needs to be followed. It needs to be enforced and if but if there's not going to be the follow-up and follow through uh, it doesn't matter what the legislation says um, so I, I think that just needs to be accountability for the information to be shared okay and then um, you I know you said you were able to view the facilities so I haven't had a chance to go yet when you did visit the facilities are you able to say, like, kind of what the conditions of the jails were or what you observed when you went? Well, we didn't see anyone. Uh, we didn't see the main housing facilities when we visited. So it's hard to, and that's where the detainees spend the majority of their time. So it's hard to say what, what the conditions are. Okay. Thank you. That, that concludes my question. Thanks. 
All right. Uh, thank you, Alderwoman. Uh, Vice Chair Aldridge, do you have any questions for Mr. Brummer? I do. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. Uh, thank you, Mr. Brummert, for uh, being here. Um, I remember during the budget committee um, when you was in front talking about uh, um, kind of uh, some funding stuff that comes from uh, that committee. It was an uh, eye opener already just into uh, the civilian oversight board. And then that following uh, maybe day or two, you know, to hear your resignation was very. Unfortunate. I know um, going back to 2014, after the death of Mike Brown, this uh, oversight commission was a huge um, ask from a lot of people, activists in the community. Uh, I know uh, um, our clerk at the time, uh, Terry Kennedy, was the one who really spearheaded that legislation back in 2015. Uh, I remember being in this room um, when committee hearings was being held on that oversight, the passion uh, from people to want to have an independent body um, outside of uh, police investigating themselves, um, but to have citizens also be able to weigh in and to have, um, you know, the Honorable uh, Alderman Clark Hubbard continue that work on and expand on it, um, I think was something that didn't just give so much benefit to the city, but so much hope um, to people that really wanted to see uh, this legislation get done and just love to see how far that it got passed. So um, to hear uh, not just from you, but also from other members on the board that um, you guys are not getting the support needed to actually make sure that uh, these laws are enforced is um, it's beyond sad and it's beyond unfortunate. Um, my question is, and all the women, Sonia asked a lot of good questions, so I'll keep it um, short. We, we t I want to kind of drill down on the training. Um, so is it in ordinance that you or your investigators or any members of the board have to, and maybe uh, all the women Clark can help with this, that, it, that the training is required to enter these facilities? Because I, I keep hearing that there was training needed, there was training needed. I had um, conversations offline that the biggest issue is that board members and yourself didn't take the proper training hours to get access to the facility. So is that a requirement? Um, it, for access to the facility, the training is not a requirement in the ordinance. That is a requirement that the corrections commissioner has insisted upon. Um, but it wasn't a requirement when I was an FBI agent to access the facility and conduct investigations. Um, and, um, and we are open to Modifying that, we are open to discussions with that, but it it seems to me that's more of an objection than it, and, and, and now having taken the training, I don't see how that has any impact on how you have access to the facility. As you took the training, um, did you get anything out of the training that, um, and you kind of answered this, that would have been beneficial um, for people that have probably never entered a detention facility to be able to be aware of maybe how to interact with people? Sure. I mean, that, yeah, there's the definite, I'm sorry to interrupt, I didn't mean to cut you off, but um, yeah, I, absolutely people who are going into the facility need to be told how to, if they've never been, and how to conduct themselves or their expectations, but that doesn't take 16 hours. Mm -hmm. I mean, that takes five minutes. I mean, that, uh, yeah, there's nothing in the, the training, in my mind, wasn't a prerequisite to being able to enter the facility. I, I don't see how it bore, other than that was something the corrections commissioner assisted upon. And the corrections commissioner uh, is under uh, the control of the, the mayor, correct? The Department of Public Safety, yes. Department of Public Safety. And, you guys brought these complaints to, um, at the time, it was Dan Isom. Yes. And his response, when you was like, the co commissioner's not letting us in for training. Well, it wasn't, it, it was the access to information. Eventually, the director's response was, give them the information. And then we still didn't receive it. We had a new director, and we still weren't getting the information. And that hold up in between was, do you know if it was? Yeah, it was a request for legal advice. Um, did you see that legal advice? And I know it's so much you can't share. I think 
you know, the, the board's dealing with that um, on some legislation now of what's... My, my response to that was we still are entitled to the information. Having read that, we still have... Act, we should... There's nothing that should prevent us from receiving that information. Um, so I guess transitioning a little bit to the, 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 the city councilor or the legal advice with as much as that you can say, uh, I, was that the, after getting that legal advice, was that the, I guess, hard stop for anything else continuing after that, that either the public safety, did anybody push back against outside of? Yeah, we, uh, the board has gone back and forth with the city councilor on, on the board members ability to get into the CJC for their jobs and their eligibility to be on the board. Um, we've, uh, yeah, we've, we've pushed back against the city councilor's office. Um, but there's, there's a way to write opinions that say, hey, this, this is the path to success as an oversight board and there's ways to write opinions that are just I found them difficult to follow and understand and they only made sense if you understood the point was to prevent us from working and in your time as being the commissioner um, outside of yourself an investigator entering uh, these detention facilities uh, and now you as a commissioner for a year was it yeah pretty much 11 months yes 11 months um, at any time, did were you guys able, outside of yourself, was any of the board members able to get into the detention facility? Uh, just on the two, six of them went through on the tours for as part of the orientation process that were, that were limited in scope. And then... When you say limited in scope, meaning... Just we didn't see the actual detainee detention areas. Where did you guys ask to see that during that orientation? I, we, at different points, we've asked to see that. I, I think initially we're like, we just show us what you're willing to show us. And then later we said we'd like to see them. As the commissioner, uh, were you able, was you ever, maybe this was the answer, were you ever able to see beyond the scope of, were you able to see the inmates? No. No. Okay. Um, I got no more questions. Like I said, I think it's, um, you know, I think it's just a lot of unfortunate, troubling um, information that we're hearing that, like you say, um, if, if there's not an issue, there's nothing to hide. Um, I, I believe that uh, the administration wants to see this uh, happen, um, um, but there is questions of why access wasn't granted. Um, I know on the state level we have the access to go into any prisons at any time and and I mean you have state reps that I, I have had no experience in law enforcement at all and there was never any questions or any pushback that was uh, obligation that you know we we had and I'm sure we have that as all the people and I plan um, to talk to my colleagues so we can take a unexpected trip to some of these uh, facilities um, to see actually what's going on um, not a call one so things can be cleaned up but it is uh, unfortunate news to hear. Even as a commissioner, you wasn't um, even able to see the detainees. And I know we keep talking about training and the orientation, but um, it, it, it's, it's, it's not adding up to me, even training or not, that you couldn't even see what was going on. That That's a sign that there's an issue. Thank you, uh, Alderman. Uh, so I have a few questions. Uh, a lot of the ground has been covered already. Um, so you, you, you stated uh, previously you had worked with the FBI? Yes. Um, and just, uh, you know, I, I, the, the only reason I'm kind of scratching the surface here is because I think that, the, you know, the FBI is the nation's premier law enforcement agency and that does go towards your credibility here. Um, what, what did you do with the FBI? I conducted... Uh Many different things, but at the end I was doing civil rights investigations. So we were investigating police officers and corrections officers. My last, one of my last investigations was into a, a, a individual that was working at the CJC. Um, so I was familiar with it. So you, you were doing 
substantially similar work with the federal government that you were coming in and yes. to with now the local. Um, so you you know your way around a detention facility yes. then. Okay. Um, and my understanding is that the board had subpoena power. That was uh, it's something that I know uh, Alderman Clark Hubbard and I had discussed uh, pretty extensively during the uh, kind of meat grinding of that legislation. Was that subpoena power something that the board ever sought to utilize? We, we discussed it but never used it because I did my position was it wasn't necessary to receive this information I didn't want to set a precedent of we have to subpoena this so I was pushing for the actual ordinance to be followed which wouldn't have required subpoenas now uh, both with your work with the federal government and then with what you were seeking to do here when when you or your team was going to be in uh, the facilities here did, did you anticipate being supervised in the facility or, or is it, would you have the discretion to go where you wanted, when you wanted? No, I anticipated that we would have to work with the, the guards or the correction officers as to where we were and where we went, you know, that we wouldn't be just let, left to run wherever we wanted to. We are willing to work with what limitations or restrictions they have knowing that it is a a difficult job for them sure and the only reason I bring that up is because I do if you were going to be unsupervised in the facility then I Absolutely. think the training would certainly be a, a very important aspect of that uh, for, for many reasons um, then uh, so yeah I, I believe from this committee from what we've we've heard today that there is a commitment to making sure that oversight works. Uh, I know that we, we debated it uh, at length on the floor uh, when coming up with the bill and we thought that we had a, a bill that um, gonna work and it seems from your testimony today that there are parts of it that are not working. Um, I would like to um, have the, well, first off, hear from kind of the, the flip side of the coin, um, just to do our due diligence on it. Uh, and then I'd also like to have this kind of serve more as the beginning of the conversation than the conversation as a whole. Would you, would you be willing to come back absolutely. in front of this committee? I, I have a question before we do that. Oh, uh, absolutely. No, and I'm, I'm, not, I'm not wrapping up, no. not just quite yet. Um, but, yeah, we, uh, you know, I, I do believe that... Um, you know, any time we're going to incarcerate individuals, that we do have a responsibility uh, to them to ensure that they're safe and that uh, you know the, the basic minimum standards uh, are, are being met uh, at the very least. Um, then, uh, yeah, it, it, knowing that you'd be willing to come back to to future hearings on this, I really appreciate that. I appreciate your your willingness to come forward today. Um, with, with the information that you've provided to us. I know it's not um, fun or easy to kind of whistle blow on, on some of these things. Um, and so I, I do respect very much what you're doing today here. Um, with that, I'll, I'll turn it back over to uh, my colleague, um, Alderman Clark Hubbard. It sounds like she has a follow-up. Right, I did. Just from, actually just from your comments, um, it made me think about a few things. First of all, Commission, um, uh, Mr. Berman, when you kept referencing they uh, seem like they don't want this to work or they, it, you know, they or it's kind of speaking to the obstruction of it. First piece, I would like to know who, if you're comfortable saying who you feel like the they is for us to know in this two part, because it really made me think about it when he said that about parts of the legislation not working. So if you can speak to that, is there something that you feel like in the legislation that hindered us having true civilian or having civilian oversight or is it was it more on the process the implementation side yeah I don't think it's the actual legislation I don't think there's another clause or that's not the substantive issue it's the whether or not we're actually going to implement it and when I refer to they it's the, the corrections commissioner it's the city councilor's office and the director of public safety I just 
could not get anywhere uh, as any any step forward. I just could not find a way forward. Um, so. And then I noticed I'm, I know that we have uh, the civilian oversight staff here, but unfortunately, since we don't have any of the board here, can you do you feel comfortable speaking on what their ask would be from us to be able to support this process better or? Knowing full, let me be clear because I know public watches. So there, there are things that Board of Aldermen, there are things that Aldermen can do and can't do, right? And I'm big on making sure we don't stand here, sit here, put on shows and make it seem like there's a pathway that that's not through us, right? But knowing how we can support in the ways that we can support from our position. So if you can speak to that, since none of them um, are here, what, what they told or how they- I believe the board has asked for the Commissioner of Corrections resignation. I believe that's, a, but I would leave it to the board to speak for themselves as to what they were asking the committee to do. Okay, and for the public to know that that's not the board of aldermen, that is the detention right. oversight Absolutely. board. Yeah. That's it. Okay. I, um, do, you, do you have a follow up? Uh, it sounds like there's another follow up from Alderwoman Velasquez. Um, and yes, thank you for being here and thank you for being willing to speak on this issue and um, what, what has transpired. Just out of curiosity, um, was there ever any frank conversation between you and the other members just about the working relationship um, between you all? I mean, between myself and the Corrections Commissioner? Yes, or and, the depart and the Director of Public Safety. We, and we, we just had multiple meetings um, and just nothing could work. We just had our positions and, and weren't willing to move or budge or find a way, I guess. I mean, so, yeah, there was, I mean, I, I, it's an answer to your question. I mean, I met with the director. I met with the corrections commissioner. The director mandated I meet with the corrections commissioner until we can, like, basically go to your room until you figure it out. Yeah, um, I'm curious just about, I mean, mediation is probably not the right word here, but, it, I mean, it sounds like there there was there might have been in addition to seeing things differently different workings and working yeah. styles and and things like that so i'm curious if there is ever any discussion between the leaders about that or if you had had some of those discussions or if anybody had talked about mediation was never mentioned everything that was a disagreement was referred to the city councilor's office and that just bogged everything down and didn't result with any movement Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you, Mr. Brumman, for your testimony. I, I imagine that uh, we'll, we'll be having you back at right. some point here. Well, thank you. Thank you for your time. And uh, with that, I, I, I do want to make sure that we hear from uh, the other side of this. I think that's us doing our due diligence here. Um, if uh, Ms. Nicole Barton could uh, please come forward. And Ms. Barton, I, I know that you're a city employee, but just because we are, um, you know, conducting oversight here, uh, I'll ask you to swear in if that's okay. Um, do you affirm that the testimony that you are going to give is true to the best of your ability? Yes, I do. All right, thank you. Um, so I know uh, I want to first thank you for coming before the uh, committee here. I know it's never fun to, to answer to, to any allegations, whether they're uh, uh, true, untrue, anything like that. And I think everyone on the committee here has an open mind and we do want to hear from you uh, about it. Um, so I guess with that, I'll let you uh, tell your side of the story. Thank you. Um, so I'm Nicole Barton. I'm the executive director for the Criminal Justice Coordinating Council out of the office of the mayor. And I was asked uh, to step in to just provide support to the DFOB while they're in transition. Um, I am personally passionate about oversight. I've been working in oversight for nine years, and I do want to make sure that this um, board is operational and functional. I was the first executive director for the Civilian Oversight Board after the ordinance was passed. And so, again, I, I want to provide support to the office and um, take steps, every step that we need to take in order to get them up and running. So um, before going into the steps that we're taking to ensure the DFOB is up and running, I want to just briefly recap um, what brought us here today. Um, in July of 2022, members were appointed, appointed to the DFOB. The DFOB faced litigation 
and civilian oversight in the city of St. Louis was entirely enjoined on September 9, 2022. The city filed a motion to modify the injunction allowing oversight for the corrections division. Although the injunction continued to affect oversight for the police division, the court entered an order modifying the injunction allowing oversight of the corrections division in response to the city's motion on October 11th, 2022. So in other words, the city acted quickly and the DFOB was only enjoined for about 30 days total. A new ordinance which resolved this litigation and allowed oversight of the police division to proceed became effective on March 24th of this year. But for these actions, civilian oversight in the city of St. Louis might still be enjoined. While the DFOB faced challenges in court for approximately 30 days, they were not prevented from acting to move forward with the necessary training that was required by the ordinance in the fall of 2022. To date, the board has not completed all the required training, which I will discuss in a moment. On October 24, 2022, Commissioner Clemens Abdullah appeared before the board to answer some of their questions and concerns. They were asked, um, as Mr. Bremen said, to provide um, those questions and, con and concerns in writing. And the board sent a letter to, the, to Commissioner Clemens Abdullah on November 29, 2022, with follow-up with those additional questions and concerns. Um, in addition, I asked the board recently if they could provide that letter to me um, as I was providing support to the board so that I could look into what those questions and concerns were and see if I could get those questions and concerns answered. Um, board members um, sent me this letter, the same letter, on this Tuesday of this week, June, 20, June 20th of this week. Um, I was going to provide a full report to them at that meeting on Tuesday, but unfortunately it was canceled. Um, according to, board, to members of the board, they never received any responses to the letter. Um, however, um, there was a response that was provided on January 9th, 2022, to the DFOB commissioner that was intended to be shared with the board. And although it didn't address all the concerns, it did address many of the questions and concerns in the letter. Um, City Council's office has advised me that they've provided multiple responses to um, commissioners' questions um, over the past year. And um, I personally share the frustration of the staff, of Mr. Brumman, of the board. Um, I know it has to be frustrating to be a board for almost a year and not being able to get done the things that you need to get done. And our administration does share uh, the board's frustration, but this process, um, with the process and what's been done to date. Um, but we do have to follow the law and make sure that ultimately the actions of the board are legitimate. So we must establish a process to get the detention facility oversight board in compliance and moving forward. And it is the goal of this administration, the mayor's office, the director of public safety, and the commissioners to make this work. I previously served as the director of civilian oversight for the city of St. Louis. And in that role, I established policies and procedures for the board to operate. The board I supported received 40 hours of training before it could investigate any complaints. Understanding the real shift in policy when it came to civilian oversight and the responsibility afforded to us, we followed national models and best practices and we joined a national organization. And I am a board member. I sit on the board of the National Association of Civilian Oversight of Law Enforcement. So we, want, we do wanna ensure that those best practices are met. Um, this board of aldermen, Alderwoman Clark Hubbard in particular, passed an ordinance that created the Civilian Oversight Division and its staff. Under this ordinance, it is the responsibility of the director, investigators, and other staff members to support both the Civilian Oversight Board and the DFOB. For the Detention Facilities Oversight Board to operate effectively, it must have a process to receive complaints 
to receive complaints and appropriate training to investigate these complaints. The board to date does not have the training required by the ordinance passed by this board to fulfill its mandate. Without this, their work is limited. It is our goal to get this board back on track. On April 27th, I attended a virtual DFOB meeting and heard concerns from a very frustrated board members and staff and requesting assistance from the mayor's office and the Office of Public Safety. On May 3rd, I responded in writing to address some of those concerns and laid out some next steps that we would help assist with the board with. And since that time, we have taken the following actions. We've identified all the necessary trainings needed to move forward. And per page 39 and 40, section 11E of the ordinance, the um, orientation trainings are laid out. They are confidentiality, Missouri Sunshine Law, citizens, detainees, and city employees' rights under the Constitution, state and federal law, state and federal laws governing police and detention facility operations, conditions and treatments of detainees, procedural justice, conflict resolution, national standards of constitutional policing, best practices for conducting investigations, labor rights and laws, history of relationships between people of color and the economically poor and the police and correctional officers. To date, I'm only aware that two trainings have been conducted. One was conducted procedural justice on May 15th. And as Mr. Brumma stated, staff and one board member did attend the detention facilities uh, training that was conducted by CJC. Missouri Sunshine Law, will be provided to the board next Wednesday, June the 28th, and I have a schedule already set for the remaining of the trainings as soon as I get a schedule from the board members of their availability. I'm working with the board and with Ruby Bonner, who's currently managing the office, after previous commissioner's resignation to get the board on track for this success. I'm requesting the board for dates, I'm sorry, I said that already, in order to complete the training. And we are working on building a framework for the policies and procedures in consultation with CJC and the city council's office. So thank you, Chair, and members of this committee. If you have any questions, I'm happy to help. Thank you. Uh, so first off, just the, the, the same question, I guess, that I, I finished with with uh, Mr. Brummond. Uh, I, I want to make sure that we're hearing from kind of all the, the various stakeholders in this to make sure that we can push this process forward because it sounds like everyone involved wants to ensure that there's adequate oversight and uh, you know whether we're regardless of what what we may be bumping heads on uh, it sounds like the end goal is is the same uh, to that end w would you be willing or someone from your office be willing to come back uh, in front of this this uh, body to, to answer questions at, at future dates? Absolutely. Okay. Um, and with that, uh, I will uh, turn it over to the board. Does uh, Alderman Clark Hubbard, do you have any questions of Ms. Barton? Oh, thank you. And thank you so much for your continued, continued commitment to civilian oversight here. Um, even prior to me getting here, reading about you and your work, you know how much I admire it. And so um, I guess listening to the report, I really don't have any questions. I'll wait to hear what my colleagues have to say, but it'll be the same thing for me still in position, what our role will be in our positions as all the persons to support whoever is in the positions, whoever is in place, but to support civilian oversight, right? Because I know sometimes we get bogged down with a person rather than the, the mission and the spirit of something. And so, um, making sure the right people are in place and making sure we are continuing to do the work on our path forward is where my heart lies. And so I'll be waiting to hear what questions my colleagues might have for you. But again, my ending question will continue to be how I can support you and how I can support civilian oversight here in the, in the um, department as a whole moving forward. Thank you. Alderwoman Keys, you got any questions? No, not, not at this time. Thank you. Alderwoman Velasquez. 
Yeah, so thank you for being here and thank you for um, all the work that you've done in this area um, for our region. So just a couple questions as I seek to understand a little bit more. Um, how, moving forward, how do you think things will be different? Um, how can we make sure that, you know, we do have a functioning process moving forward? Well, I mean, I hope that we um, are working in the spirit of ensuring that um, the ordinance that was passed that we get this board operational and functional as it states out. I think Mr. Brumman said it very well. The legislation will work if it's followed. So we wanna make sure that we're following that and working in the spirit of that. I've already started meeting weekly with uh, Commissioner Clemens Abdullah to work on what this process will look like to receive and share complaints and make sure we're building a um, foundation and framework. I've used um, the process that um, the, uh, Mr. Brum and his staff have already developed, and we're just expanding off of that. Um, and as the ordinance states, we would do it in consultation. We would work on this process in consultation with CJC, um, City Council's office. And I don't know what was happening before. It's unfortunate and it's sad. Um, whatever happened that um, the work hasn't been start, you know, that we weren't able to get work done to this point. But my hope is that we are able to work together um, as city departments and agencies to make sure that we're getting uh, the process developed, the training needed so that they can function and do the work that they were designed to do. Now, I know that we've talked a lot about training in various capacities in this uh, meeting and um, Training is required, obviously, to keep everybody safe. Um, I'm gonna put on my former journalist hat. Some might say that, well, could that be an excuse? I mean, what, what, what's to stop, what, I guess, what's to stop things from moving forward or is, once we get the training, are, are you confident that the board can move forward in its role or there'll be some other kind of thing that might present a new obstacle? Well, I certainly hope not. I believe that once the training is complete and the process and the procedures are developed, that, it, that we can function the way that, we're, that it's intended to function. I don't have any other questions right now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Alderwoman. Uh, Alderwoman Sunnye, do you have any questions for uh, Ms. Barton? I do. Hi, Ms. Barton. Uh, you know that I love your work and that I too, like Alderman Clark Hubbard, have known of your work for a long time, even before it was officially the city. So um, I'm glad, you know, similarly, I know that it's not an easy position. You know, I feel like I'm very familiar and getting more and more familiar with, you know, when you're in a certain position and being really passionate and trying to be an advocate and how officially becoming a part of the institution means you have new requirements and new standards and you have to figure out how to navigate that while still honoring your passion and your commitment. And so I know that that's probably definitely not easy for you. So I just want to acknowledge that that struggle and thank you for being willing to come before us today. Thank you. Um, I similarly, I would just love to know more about your role as, as director um, of, you know, of the Civilian Oversight Board, just a little bit about your duties. You know, there may be people at home who are watching that are not familiar with what that is, and I'm sure we all could learn more. So I just love to know, like, what, what are your duties? What are your responsibilities? A little bit, what's your days like? Yeah, well, you mean when I was the director previously? The director. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, so, yes, yeah, so when the ordinance was passed, um, um, board members were appointed just like they were to the DFOB. Um, when I stepped in, we worked, I worked closely with the city council's office and the board to develop policies and procedures. Um, we had obstacles just as well with um, police oversight. And um, we had to, you know, develop a good working relationship with Internal Affairs Division in order to get the work done that we needed to get done. Um, there were uh, times that we weren't getting the information that we requested um, to, and the same thing, we had to call in public, pu the public safety director at the time um, to ask for assistance in moving it forward. Once we got past, once we did the training, I would go back and say that there was a 40-hour training in the very beginning that all our staff and board members had to complete before we could even review one complaint. 
Um, so there's a basic, you know, foundation there that has to be completed in order to get some of the work done, and that's best practices around the nation. Um, so, you know, we definitely want to make sure that that's done, but we were able, we got all of the training done in the first few months. Um, we met every week uh, for four hours a week for 10 weeks to get the training done. And um, we, like I said, worked together um, in consultation with city council's office to develop a process and procedure in consultation with the police department to develop a process and procedure in order to be able to receive review and make recommendations on complaints. Um, we did, you know, investigations. We went into, I developed the process with the jail, um, even back then, so that if someone was detained and they did want to file a complaint against police, they had access to us to be able to do that. So um, if we got a complaint from someone who was in corrections, we, we would go see them um, to get a verbal statement from them and so that we can move forward with the investigation process. Um, and then we, our staff, would um, put together an investigation packet to present to board members at the board meetings, and then the board would hear those recommendations and investigation packet, all the facts and evidence included along with that, um, and they would either agree or disagree with the internal affairs findings, and then I would submit, submit those our final recommendations back to the chief, who would then have to correspond back um, to say whether they would implement recommendations or whether they would discipline um, the officer or not. Okay. Um, do you feel like during your time that you were able to exercise dis disciplinary action or able to make recommendations and act in the capacity of your title? So we were able to make recommendations and some of those were, um, um, the, the, some of those were implemented by the police department. We didn't make recommendations at the time that I was the director for discipline. The chief did all, all of the discipline. So um, we made just recommendations on whether we would agree or disagree with the findings of internal affairs. We could make recommendations to have a full investigation done if we didn't think the investigation was done properly. And we could make recommendations. We would review the policies and procedures of the police department that would go along with the complaints. And we would make recommendations um, about policy and procedure implementation or changes as well. And then my next question is kind of germane to the training because I know you mentioned 40 hours a week, uh, four hours a week for 10 weeks. Um, so my question is similar, like I asked Mr. Berman, was that kind of made to you early on that that would be the expectation? And also, I think you're saying 40 and Mr. Berman says 16, so I'm also curious about it was 40 hours per person or was that for, you know, just about the training a little bit? What, 40 hours does seem like a lot to me, but was that expectation clear to you at first? And also that's different than what I heard Mr. Brumman say about the 16 hours. Yeah, so I'll answer both questions. So the 40 hours, so the similar to this ordinance, um, the, the training was outlined in the ordinance, the necessary training. I worked with the police department. I also worked with our local universities to develop the training. Um, so the 40 hours of training that we got was actually like a, a citizen academy training, except it was developed specifically for civilian oversight board. So I worked directly with the police academy and the police department to develop the training that we needed in order to um, follow the, the requirements of the ordinance. And then the trainings that we didn't receive with the police department, um, I went through, like I said, our local universities and had professors um, come in and do some of the trainings that we needed. Um, the 16 hours that um, Mr. Bremen is referring to, those are the detention facility um, training that was required by the detention facility. So um, there still is the trainings that are required in the ordinance that I read out um, earlier. But that 16 hours was required, is required by um, the CJC commissioner for any vendors or any um, people that provide services to come into the jail. Okay. Um, I guess to me that sounds a little bit about where the miscommunication might have been because 
in the ordinance, um, what Mr. Brumman mentioned is that, you know, there's something in there about orientation, but not any details about any, any training, like that that's not mentioned in the legislation. Yeah, so the orientation is the training. The, 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 the bullets that I read out, that is the, that's part of the training. The detention facility training, that 16 hours was just a separate, well, it's not really even separate because if um, in the ordinance it says um, that they would need uh, detainees, um, uh, I'm sorry, detention facility operation training. Okay, and can you, can you confirm how many members have undergone the training or? To, to my knowledge, um, there was a procedural justice training, and I was there, so I witnessed. I know it was done. <laughs> so procedural justice training was actually done by Mr. Brumman on uh, May 15th for all staff and board members. And all, or most of the staff and at least one board member attended the detention facility 16-hour training on May 9th and 10th. So, but the rest of the board members still need that detention facility training. And I'm working with the commissioner. Well, I'm working with the board to get their schedule so that we can roll that training out to them as quickly as possible because that is a hindrance from, for them being able to gain access to the facility. And then next week on Wednesday the 28th, um, city councilor's office will be delivering the Missouri Sunshine Law training to the board and staff as well. Okay. Um, and did you ever witness anyone objecting to any of the trainings arranged by the former commissioner or any, uh, you know, because I imagine you were kind of a key role. So d did you witness any objections or intentional barriers that might have been set or proposed? Yes, yeah, so um, I've attended the last three meetings. So that was when I was asked to step in and help provide some support. I didn't no, I don't didn't see anyone objecting to any trainings. Not staff, not um, not board members. And I know you mentioned that you are got everyone scheduled, so you're you know you're working on it. Do you have an ideal deadline in mind of when you would like to try to get whatever needs to be arranged and scheduled scheduled by? Any timelines in mind? Yeah, so I think it depends on the, because the board members are volunteers, so we want to work around their schedule. I think it depends on their availability. I've um, made some suggestions um, that we do it bi-weekly. Um, if they are able to set aside one day every other week for a certain amount of hours, um, if they are able to do that, um, I have uh, trainers that are available to do complete the rest of the training. They just need a two-week notice. And so, like I said, one is already scheduled for next week. So as soon as I get their availability, I think we can roll through the trainings pretty quickly, and I would hope within about three to four months we might be able to have it done. And are you, has there been any thought or consideration given to uh, closed session type meetings or any way that the information that they're requesting or visits, is there, is there any way that that can be done within the three or four months? Is, you know, because they're trying to exercise their job and do their functions, mm -hmm. and it sounds like that's the longest timeline. And they're saying, and I, I think there is some perspective to that of, you know, these seems like intentional barriers. Are they gonna, is the suggestion gonna be that they're gonna have to wait until all of them have it done? Or is there anything being done remedied in the meantime to get them what they're asking for? Yeah, so what we've asked is that, um, well, I'm working to try to make sure the investigators themselves are able to get into the facility and do the investigation. That hasn't really been happening either. That's kind of separate from the board members' responsibilities too. But we want to make sure that the staff are able to do their jobs. So working on um, this process, is, although it's not completely in writing yet, that we're doing a, um, sort of a workaround while we're working on you know, writing the process and procedures out, is that once a complaint is received, that would have to be shared Either way, whether the complaint was generated inside the facility or outside the facility and given directly to DFOB, that complaint will have to be shared between the parties. Um, they can will contact the um, um, CJC's director's administrative 
uh, person to set the visit up, and they should still be able to gain access to do the actual investigation, providing that there's no civil litigation. I want to make that clear, that that person that's filed the complaint has not filed civil litigation against the city, because we have had that come up already, too. So that we couldn't impede on that person's rights by doing the investigation if there's the civil litigation going on at the same time. Okay, and this last question, it may be one for you, it may be better for Mr. Brumman. You know, to me, what is highly concerning is the folks who are in this facility, they, you know, some of them are likely our residents or people we serve, and it does sound like right now the functions of the board, you know, are not being done. And, and you know, again, these are people who have not been accused of a, you know, they've been accused, but they're still innocent. Um, and so they're in these facilities. And so for me, I know the goal of, it seems like we all agree on the core goal of the Civilian Oversight Board. Do we know about any current practices that are, and I guess it's hard to say because if the COB can't get in there, I'm not sure who the best party would be to ask this. But, you know, I, I think there's been a lot of things about the conditions of the jail and things that are from, and again, just things that I've heard are allegations, but that are inhumane and that are unfair to people that have not been accused of a crime. And we have this board that's not able to operate and do its function. And I think that's why some people are saying, well, training, th that, that seems like such a formal barrier for people who are experiencing, you know, life-altering conditions mm -hmm. and, and experiences. And jail can be very difficult on your mental health and, and what you're going through. And we want these folks to be able to come out and have their day and have their time. So do you, um, and I guess I was also trying to ask Mr. Bremen this earlier, just about the conditions of the jail. Again, mm -hmm. I've read things about the periods of, of lockdown holds being, you know, excessively long, uh, long. I think we were having some issues with some of the, the water systems in the facilities. And so I'm curious about what you might know about some of the conditions of jail, of, of the facility, and then also just, I think similarly echoing my, my colleagues, whatever we can do to address this as soon as possible. Four months sounds so long if some of the things I've heard are going on, like people going in and not getting access to certain medications that they may need. I mean, it's such a volatile situation that I'm very concerned. We all saw the, the, the riots and we saw, like that's what people do when they're in a sense of desperation. And so, I want to offer my support of whatever I can do to help us get this right as soon as possible and offer that I think four months is extremely long. Um, and so whatever we need to do. And then also, what do you know or what can you share about the conditions of the of the jails and what, what may be happening? I know you were executive director. Did you observe anything that was of concern for you right now that some of our civilian oversight board members are not in position to advocate or lift up because they weren't able to get access? Mm -hmm. So um, I'll say that one thing that I'm trying to work on is um, something that we had going on before, and that is for staff to be able to attend dorm rep meetings. Um, and so I would like for that to start again. So um, staff, myself and staff will come to dorm rep meetings. Um, part of that we would like, what I would like to see is being able to educate. So dorm rep meetings are um, a group of um, individuals um, that have pretty good behavior that come together to meet with CJC staff and um, other representatives of uh, administration or community um, to talk about any issues that might be going on and like how to work through those issues. And so what we were doing before was we would attend those dorm rep meetings. Um, what I want to see is that we're, we start being able to attend those again so that we can educate um, the detainees on what this process of filing a complaint would look like, make sure that they have complaint forms readily available to them so that they can um, get those um, complaints filed if they need to. And that gives us an opportunity to be able to hear from people that are detained on what, condi what conditions are like or what their concerns are um, so that we can, you know, help move that forward. Aside from that, I'm working in my other CJCC capacity um, with Dr. Mahdi and, um, and other representatives of the city to get the backlog of um, those mental health evaluations, court-ordered mental health evaluations caught up, get people the services that they need 
whether it's behavioral health or mental health. Um, and we're working um, diligently trying to work on a contract, the RFP, to get out to provide those services that people that are detained and have been detained for a while desperately need. So, um, you know, I'm working on <laughs> in different capacities trying to ensure that people that are detained are getting services that they need to because we are concerned. I can tell you they are not on lockdown 23 hours a day. Um, that's been probably almost a year. Since that happened, we had an incident where a CO was injured. And so th there was a lockdown, a safety lockdown done for a period of time. Um, but they're only locked down from 10 p.m. to 6 a.m. And then during breakfast, lunch, and dinner, um, all of the detainees are rotated out and have access to their tablets. Um, was there another question? I feel like I didn't answer something. Um. No, I think I, my other question was just about, you know, are we treating this with the sense of urgency and, and expediency that it, that it is? I mean, I, I worked as a mental health advocate, and so, you know, I've had situations where I've had to do things with patients in all types of, of, of mm -hmm. situations. And, you know, I understand that we have compliance and we have processes and things that we have to do, but I also want us to remember that these are you know, these are people, these are our people, these are uh, other residents, these are neighbors, and I just, it really concerns me that it may take up to four months for me, and I think even for some of the concerns that I've had just amongst community, referencing training when people's lives and their treatment are, is on the line, just, you know, one doesn't really compare to the other, so whatever we can do just mm -hmm. to expedite this with urgency to address all of the the concerns and to be as as clear as possible because people who are in this situation and who are in this facility they're not on our time they're not on our type of clock they got a whole nother set of risk factors and and challenges and they're in there now without a civilian oversight board without this entity that we all want to be mm -hmm. able to hold accountable that's not happening right now yeah so i want to say that um it won't um so the four months was just a time frame that i'm given to roll out the training that's not going to impede on the work that we want to get we want to happen now as far as the investigators being able to come in um, and meet with these detainees that have filed complaints um, and to be able to get the information that they need that's just the role they're training out so yeah we're trying to work uh, work around so that the investigators can get in and still do their job. The board cannot really vote on a complaint until they've completed training. So I'm hoping that as the investigators are going in now to be able to do the investigation and meet with the complainants um, as we're, we're working on the training at the same time. So, so I just don't want you to think we're not going to be able to do investigations for four months. That's not what I'm saying. <laughs> so. Yeah, it's not that. I just think even for the board members who are waiting, four months is a long time before they're able to do to do their duty. And, um, you know, that's the entity that I'd like to see uh, exercising the accountability and able to tell us what's going on. So I think four months is still a while for them to be able to do what they need to do. Mm -hmm. And I just want to make clear, too, the ordinance, and I don't know where Clark all the women Clark Hubbard went, but it wasn't designed for um, board or anyone to just go inside the jail and solicit complaints, though the ordinance was developed to be an oversight to the complaint process. So um, I think, you know, there's been some discussion about just going in and just being able to randomly um, walk down the halls or something, I don't know, but but I want to make sure that we're making clear that nobody's going in soliciting complaints, that this is complaint driven. So we, but we want to make sure that every detainee has access to the complaints so they can get them to us so that we can have proper oversight. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, thank you, uh, Alderman Sonier. Um, so I just have a couple of questions that are not my questions. They're uh, the vice chair's questions, but wanted to make sure that they got uh, asked. Um, so the, the 40 hours a week for 10 weeks, uh, is there any way to uh, reduce the, the overall time frame on that training? Uh, it just seems like there's a lot of yeah, so, uh, many hours of it. Yeah, so that was the training that we did for police oversight. Okay. So I'm not saying it's going to take 40 hours to get this this done because though it's the Missouri Sunshine Law, for example, that's going to be given next week, 
probably an hour or less, if that makes sense. So mm -hmm. I was just given, when we did police oversight, it was very extensive training um, for that board, and it was 40 hours. So. Okay, and then he asked if you had, and I, I believe it's in there, uh, but he asked if uh, there was a specific part of the legislation that stated that training was required. So um, on pages 39 and 40, section 11E of the ordinance lays out the orientation training that's needed. Okay, um, then it, it sounds to me like we uh, are, are basically, we all want the same thing here and that's to, to to ensure that there is oversight in these facilities. Uh, as Alderman Sonnier pointed out, many of the people in these facilities have not yet been found guilty of a crime and may not be found guilty of a crime. Uh, I think it's also important to note that even for the people who uh, have been found guilty or will be found guilty uh, by, by the courts or by a jury of their peers, that the vast majority of these people are going to come out of these facilities and they're going to be our neighbors. And I think it's important that we remember that uh, and, and remember the way that we treat people or allow people to be treated while they're in our uh, detention facilities. Those are going to be our neighbors. And if, if we allow them to be treated poorly, they're gonna be people who come out of there with uh, physical and mental trauma. Uh, and that uh, I, I want uh, these systems to work correctly, both in terms of uh, our incarceration systems and in terms of uh, the oversight of them, because when, when someone comes out of these facilities, I want them to get back to being a productive member of society. And I think a lot of that comes down to the way that they are treated and the uh, skills that they may gain and our ability to rehabilitate them uh, mentally to, to some extent. Um, and it sounds like you're, you're shaking your head yes. It sounds like you agree with me on, uh, on a lot of that. Um, and so I, I think that moving forward, I'd like to uh, set another date at, at, at both of your uh, convenience. And I apologize for the short notice on this one. Uh, just when, when this came to light, I thought it was uh, inherent on this committee to, to take these allegations seriously and to uh, start a discourse as fast as possible on it uh, to ensure that we were doing what we needed to do in our oversight capacity. Um, but uh, moving forward, I'd like to have the, the Director of Public Safety. Is there anyone else that you believe uh, uh, should be present to, to, that we should be hearing from? Mm -hmm. The Director of Public Safety would be a good person to yeah. Okay, uh, then I, I'll certainly invite Mr. Brummond and I'll follow up with Mr. Brummond as well to see if there's anyone that he believes uh, should be present for the conversation. But um, I, I, I'm committed and I believe that my colleagues are committed and it sounds like both Mr. Brummond and yourself are committed to actually making sure this thing works. And uh, regardless of the... Uh, and we have that same commissioner to come? Uh, sure, sure. Uh, we can have the commissioner. Um, we'll invite the commissioner, certainly. Um, but I, I believe that um, if everyone's on the same page and we're just uh, bumping heads over you know, technicalities, we can work through that. And I think we can probably work through it relatively quickly uh, because I think that the, the vast majority of people throughout the city of St. Louis and in this room are, are, are looking for the same thing. Uh, and with that, uh, I'll thank you for your testimony today. I know it's it's not fun, especially on short notice, um, and I, I think you did a great job, and I look forward to the conversation continuing. Uh, I know being on the hot seat is never never fun, uh, so thank you so much for coming before us and, and sharing uh, uh, your testimony with us, and I look forward to continuing the conversation. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, for members, and thank you for support staff and Mr. Brumman for being here today as well. Thank you. Uh, and with that, um, you, you did at the commissioners clearly. Yes, yes. Uh, and so, 
Do we have any written testimony, uh, Madam Clerk? Okay. Uh, with that, uh, we'll move to excuse members. I, I will. I, I want to. Oh, uh, go I, ahead. Uh, just I know before we skip over that, because we said who the current commissioner is. So I want to make sure people know if Ms. Bonner can come up and tell people, because it's not technically probably not commissioner, but who's in the, the capacity right now and making sure that she also knows and has our full commitment Thank on you. what's going to help you not only keep it going, but make sure it moves forward. So if you had any comments or things for us, just let us know now. I don't uh, does she so. have to be sworn I, in? I'm sorry. Uh, if, uh, yeah, if, if you would please swear in. Uh, do, do you, uh, will you state your name? My name is Ruby Bonner. And uh, do you swear or affirm to tell the, the truth to the best of your ability today? I do. All right. Uh, proceed with any, any uh, statements that uh, may be responsive to uh, Alderman Clark Hubbard. Did you have questions or you no, want to? No, I didn't have any questions. I just wanted to basically bring you up and, well, again, thank you. Excuse me. And thank the staff, introduced you because, again, the public is watching. And then make my full commitment, I'm sure my colleagues, is, and if you have anything that you want us to do to help support you moving forward in this um, and what we all want here with civilian oversight. I am very encouraged by the comments from the members of the board. Um, I know a little bit about the history of civilian oversight. I, too, was here back in the days after the Michael Brown shooting and sat in the audience as board members debated yeah. the, the um, bill or the, the issue. So I know it was a very hard one piece of legislation that you... Alderwoman um, Clark Hubbard has continued to do. I came out of retirement to do this work. You know, not only am I committed to it uh, from the standpoint of a citizen, I'm committed to it from the standpoint of a mother and a grandmother. So, and I came on the police side, but after getting here and understanding more about the the correction side, I'm deeply passionate about that as well. And I had the honor of working alongside of Commissioner Brumman. I don't mind telling you how much respect I had for his credentials, because I, I read, I applied for the position. I didn't get it, and I'm really glad I didn't. I <laughs> no say that. <laughs> but I came after reading about his credentials. And I told him as much, my God, you know, you're perfect. You're perfect for this job. And also I have a great deal of respect for those board members. They're very knowledgeable. They're very committed. They're very passionate. So I've enjoyed working with them as well. And it has been difficult to see the growing frustration on the part of the board members on the part of the commissioner. I was pretty much involved on more of the administrative side, but I am a lawyer. I've been a lawyer for 40 years, and I'm a former uh, director of CREA. So I am totally uh, involved in the treatment of people and making sure there's equity and inclusion wherever I am that everybody is treated with dignity and respect, including those persons who have been detained in our facility, as you say, who have not been convicted. But even if they are convicted, our Constitution guarantees certain treatment of them, and they need to be treated humanely wherever they are. So I just want you to know I am committed to this work. I have a relationship with the commission. He already knows. He's on speed dial. So he, he may not be present, but I know how involved and committed he is, and I know that he is very much concerned about this work happening, and to whatever extent that I can make sure that it does. While I'm here, that's what I want to do. And certainly any one of you are welcome to come over. You're welcome to call us with any concerns, and I appreciate your service. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I one more comment. Sure, absolutely. Okay. Oh, no, not for you, Miss. <laughs> okay. Not for you, Miss Bonner, but I thank you. I, I want to note how much of a blessing we have 
two people that have been in place and are still in place to carry this work on for us. Um, I don't know if anybody had any other thing, but I wanted to make an announcement. So, uh, I think uh, Alderman, okay. Alderwoman, excuse me, Alderman Aldridge uh, had a, a comment before the announcement. Okay. Um, uh, no, no, please proceed. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, trying to do two things at once here. Um, I think uh, all the women, um, Sonia, and I wasn't able to be in here uh, for a lot of uh, her discussion uh, about it, and I think she really hit on it. I just want to go on record um, and, and say, you know, the hopefully uh, as um, there's an interim that steps in, uh, in my opinion, I don't know what the training looks like, not saying that it is not worthy or that it is not uh, worth doing it, but I think, you know, um, 40 hours a week to volunteers that are stepping up to um, do this role just seems a little, uh, uh, seems like a lot, and I would hope that maybe some of that training can get uh, tailored down a little bit so that it doesn't have to be um, so much for individuals that are, you know, going in to make sure some of these detainees are being treated fairly. So I want to go on record with that and also want to go on record and say um, um, I know Ms. Ruby personally and I know she's committed to this work uh, and doing this work and I look forward to standing with her and the rest of the staff in whatever way possible to make sure that uh, this board actually has the power to do what they need to do. It sounds like the legislation um, is in good standing, but we need to get all these roadblocks out of the way so that people can actually do uh, what's necessary to make sure that uh, inmates in these facilities are actually being treated humanely. Thank you. Thank you for that. And uh, I'll turn it over to Alderman Clark Hubbard for her announcement. Okay, yeah. I just wanted to say before we adjourn <coughs> that this committee, right, public safety, and we're talking about this piece, which is definitely reactive, but I want to make sure publicly for any other um, anybody that's listening to make sure you share that the city just opened up a youth spaces program grant um, to organize and fund individuals to provide space for programming for St. Louis youth ages 15 to 25. We know the challenges we're having in the city right now. And so making sure that this kind of information is shared as much as it can so that we can possibly save people from getting into the spaces that we are now fighting for the treatment now okay again so you all know I'm very proactive as much as reactive so please uh, go to stlareavpc.org youth hyphen safe hyphen space if you have an organization or you have people that are on the ground or you have just a gift that you'll be able to reach our youth and change their mindsets on some of the bad actions and bad choices that they're making right now, please apply for these grants and please create these spaces for them so that we can make a better space to Ms. Bonner's point for the grandmothers and the mothers and the fathers here in the community. So again, that's stlareavpc.org, youth hyphen safe hyphen space. The grants are uh, from 1000 to $25,000 depending on the scope. So, and it's just about creating the space for our youth. And thank you for letting me make that announcement. Absolutely. And uh, Alderman Sonia, you had a, an announcement? Um, I don't know if this is an announcement or an ask, but I do know that when um, the uh, when Director Abdullah did come before budget, we asked if, you know, would we be able to go on a tour? Sorry. Um, when, when Director, I, I don't know her formal title, but when she came before budget, um, and we had these conversations, she said we could go on a tour. I think it would make a lot of sense for us as a public safety committee to, you know, go on a tour and, and, and see the facilities. So I guess that's an ax to the chair. Sure. And yeah, I, I'm in the process of putting together, uh, you know, that for um, both the real time crime center as well as um, you know, our detention facilities, uh, because I, I do believe that you need to understand what's actually there if you're going to oversee it in the meaningful way. So we certainly will be doing that. I'm hoping to arrange for that uh, during the legislative break. Thank you. Absolutely. And just to uh, tack on to Alderwoman Clark Hubbard's announcement, uh, just for anyone out there who may be interested, we are going to be continuing the Prop S discussion uh, that we had a few weeks back here um, for uh, funding for violence prevention, essentially, uh, here in the city, uh, particularly tailored towards uh, kids. So uh, stay tuned for that. And uh, with that, I will entertain a motion to excuse Alderman Oldenburg. So moved. 
second. All right, there's uh, been a motion and a second. Uh, there's a request for roll call on this. Uh, so, Matthew Clerk, could you please call the roll? Auto Woman Clark Hubbard. Aye. Who did this? <laughs> Auto Woman Keys. Aye. Auto Woman Velasquez. Aye. Auto Woman Sonye. Aye. Auto Woman Aldrich. No. <laughs> Chair Norian. Aye. Okay. We have five aye votes and one no. All right. So, uh, Alderman Aldridge can take that up with Alderman Oldenburg <laughs> in the future. Um, and uh, with that, I will entertain a uh, motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Second. Uh, previous roll. Uh, <laughs> there's been a request for previous roll. Hearing any objections? None. Hearing none, uh, the Public Safety Committee is now adjourned. Thank you all.